that's why it's so important to have consistency in even your day-to-day work. The importance is not stressed enough, especially to the younger generation. Those 10,000 hours, because not only do you learn how to pivot, but you also know how to work automatically. Your brain can focus on something else. Welcome to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods, the nation's first podcast devoted to the business and lifestyle of the hospitality industry. Now, here's your host, Woolco Foods CEO, Stephen Toberoff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. I am your host, Stephen Toberoff. And today I'm very excited because I have the opportunity to interview two guests instead of just one, one of whom I've known for quite a while, one of whom I've come to know recently, but but people I have um, a lot of respect for, they're making a big impact in the restaurant industry and in content creation. We're going to have a very interesting and, and, and sort of far-ranging discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. So first, I want to introduce Brian Sow. He is the chef owner of Mission Sandwich Social. He also has a YouTube channel, Pro Chefs React. And Brian, I want to thank you for coming in. And then I've got a returning guest, a longtime friend and someone who I've interviewed uh, in depth in an earlier episode, and I would highly recommend you check that out. And that is my good friend, Paul who is the chef owner of Le Ravage. Paul, great to see you again. Well, I'm happy to be here. This is, believe it or not, a first for me. It's great. And one other thing I should mention, Paul and Brian together host a phenomenal podcast and YouTube channel called So You Want to Get Fat. Their most recent episode was with Jacques Torres, and it's a it's a great episode. It's a great channel with a lot of great content. So great to see you, Paul and Brian. Thanks for coming out here. Thanks for having us. So... What I'd like to do to just sort of jump in and get a little background is, and I'd start with you, Brian, if you don't mind. Brian, just tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the Mission Sandwich Social as well as your YouTube channel. Sure. I mean, I've been a professional chef or working in the industry for nearly two decades at this point. And before I opened Mission Sandwich Social, I was a chef at a very large corporate restaurant group, not going to name names. Go ahead, name it. Not going to name names. Name it. Not going to name names. Okay. But uh, I learned a lot there. I cut my teeth there, um, made lifelong friends over there. But ultimately, the corporate atmosphere is not for me. I grew up in a small business family, and I always wanted to fend for myself, wanted to do something food-wise that was more approachable, I would say. Not so much elevated cuisine something the everyday man we could eat every day. And a buddy of mine wanted to open a sandwich shop in Brooklyn. And funny enough, he, when he brought the idea to me, his first question was, are you okay with doing this kind of concept or is that too beneath you? And I was like, too beneath me? Let me tell you, I, I love sandwiches. And I jumped right into the opportunity. Some of my earliest best food memories have to do with sandwiches. I'm of you know Asian descent. But working for my dad growing up, every now and then he would order sandwiches from the deli. And it was just such a memorable moment the first time I had a, a hero, a sub sandwich. And uh, I just dived right in, started doing the R&D late 2019. We all know what happened early 2020. And uh, rather than kind of wallow in despair, I used uh, most of the pandemic as an R&D period until finally things started to change, you know, the restrictions started to lift up and I was able to find a location and open up shop. It's great. And I have a lot of uh, respect because to start a business is one thing and then to start it and have that happen is another. Now, I have to ask, and this will dovetail into the content creation, how did you and Paul come together and decide to co-host this podcast called So You Want to Get Fat? Can I tell the story? Yeah, you can tell the story. Before we even get <laughs> to how the podcast came to be, I need to talk about how we <laughs> came to yeah, be. Yeah, please, please. Um, Paul and I were both on a Food Network show called Beat Bobby Flay. We were on this. And share no expense of the expletives. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Paul and I were on the same season of Beat Bobby Flay. And as the show started airing, I was watching every episode because I wanted to see who else would win. 
I, I won. I won. I, I'm the only winner of season one. And uh, out of all the episodes I watched, there's only one guy I remember out of all the other contestants. And it was you, <laughs> Chef Paul Denamiel of Le Ravage Restaurant, because he was such a fucking asshole to the other contestant. <laughs> and he was such a good, bad guy. And I never forgot his face. And I, I just... I watched the episode. It, it passed. I, I was happy. I was the only winner of season Listen, one. Listen, I was a big fan of wrestling, you know? Yeah. So the heel... Oh, I can relate. The yeah. heel was always the... And you were a great heel. You I was were a great. so arrogant and cocky and just, you know, putting it in the other contestant's face. For example, in the first round, he's going. you go up against another chef, before, yeah, and whoever wins that goes up against Bobby. And he finished his fucking dish early and he ran over to the other side to see if he can help the contestant. <laughs> I love it. But Paul, of course, has the credibility to do that because yeah. with all the years in the business and your pedigree, but it's it's always the heel, it's always the bad guy that makes these shows so interesting, yes. you know? The villain is always what you don't you don't want to say you root for him, but you you want him to have some success. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this much. I remembered you. I remember everything about you and everything about that episode. It's actually a very deeply, watching that episode is a very deeply ingrained memory for me. Come four or five months later, we're both attending the James Beard party at the old Todd English food hall. And here, you know, I'm, I'm stuffing my face with a Lady M crepe cake because they were giving them shits out for free. And, and they had, remember they had like, um, they had like special hostesses handing out the desserts yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who do I see coming down the escalator? I did one of the Golden Trump escalator rides yeah. coming down. <laughs> who do I see coming down the escalator? It is Paul DeNamuel. And I'm with my wife and I go, honey, that's that's the asshole I was telling you about on <laughs> Beat Bobby Flay. I got to go say hi. <laughs> so as soon as he gets off the escalator, I jump right in front of his face. You don't know me. I don't know you. But we were both on Beat Bobby Flay, and uh, we didn't exchange information, but I do have a photo of that, mm -hmm. right, which you've seen. And it wasn't, but I, it, we just kept on bumping into each other at the same places, and that's it. And um, I would say, like, where we really cemented our friendship it was over took, Bon Jovi I, and I karaoke. I think it only took three dates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three dates. You, you know, that's a cool story because, like, from our perspective, we'll call, we've had the pleasure of working with you for a long time, Paul. Oh, you and have, have to use lot, the word pleasure. No, but, 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 but here, you know, here's the thing. Like, we have, we have a lot of customers, thank God, but there's always some customers that their name rings out because they've, engendered the respect of the staff here. And you're one of them. You know, I remember a lesson I learned from my father, like there, there are some chefs and you could meet this in other parts of life. And this is kind of related to what you're saying, but there are some chefs that are demanding and difficult, but there's no real gravitas behind it. And so all it does is engender enmity. And then there are the chefs that are demanding, but they're making you better. And they have that credibility and that gravitas. And I think you are absolutely in that mold. And I could see how that would have come through. I didn't see the TV shows, but I could see why it had such an impact on you, Brian. And so as you guys got to get to know one another, what made you, dis whose idea was it to do a podcast? Because you do have great chemistry and it is great content. Well, uh, how long have you and I have been friends for? 12, 13, 14 years now, something like that? That's... No, 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 about... I would say, Mike, I've been doing this for about 15 years. I remember we wow. became friends. I'm, so that was, that was 12 years ago, that, that episode of Bobby Yeah, Fair. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. We, we've, been, we've been friends for, yeah, about 15 years, I would say, because I was about five years into my career at that point. I was very green, very new. And you were like one of the buddies I would hit up all the time asking questions. You have an oven guy. Do you have a refrigeration guy? I still do that. I still do that <laughs> to this day. Yeah. But uh, as far as how the podcast came to be, I started creating content on YouTube during the pandemic. You know, I just kept myself very busy and I created a show called Pro Sh The channel's called Chef Brian Sal, my name, but that's what it says on my birth certificate, Chef Brian Sal. But uh, I started having Paul on as a guest on my channel and my audience just took to him right away as... I think anybody would when they get to meet Paul, you know, unless unless he's placing an order with you, 
you know, on <laughs> worst food orders because I've seen you place your orders before. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my fucking god. Yeah, but god. what chef is still yeah. placing all his orders and everything yeah, like true. that after 40 years, yeah, you know? True, true. It's true. But uh, I, I had him on as a guest on my show, Pro Chef Reacts. The audience took to him so well. And the main thing was him and I were having a blast. So I kept inviting him back. And I was at a point with my... <laughs> with my sandwich shop, Mission Sandwich Social, where it was it was going to go one of two ways. It was either going to go under or finally make it through. And I don't know what possessed me to start thinking, let me start another project. And I asked Paul, you know, would you want to start another channel, another YouTube channel, start this podcast? I think we have great chemistry. We clearly like being in each other's company. We already hang out all the time. Why don't we just throw some cameras on. I'll take, I'll handle everything. You just show up and you be pretty. And that's I sure am pretty. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much how it happened. And so Paul, with respect to doing the podcast and this, has it had any impact in terms of how you operate Le Ravage? Has it changed your perspective of the restaurant industry or has it just been this new sort of activity and endeavor that you're passionate in that you like, and it's it's just another sort of add-on to everything else that you're doing? Just one criteria. It needs to be fun. I told him, as soon as it's not fun, we're not doing this anymore. And so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the only thing from the perspective of the restaurant, I think I tend to make a little bit more effort um, to spend time in the dining room if someone makes a request to see me, especially if they say they saw the podcast. So that it's rejuvenated a love of the interaction with the customers again. Because for so many years I did that and it just, it, it occupies a, a huge chunk of your time. So I remember going through the dining room with my chef outfit and it would take me 45 minutes just to get through the dining room to the point where I, I used to change in the kitchen and leave incognito and be able to go home. And now I'm back to finding that love again of taking the time and, and appreciating the effort that people came because of the show. So it's a, it's a different percentage of people that I've never known before. So it's like a new conversation. It's new. So it's fun. It's, now it's fun again. It makes a lot of sense. And also, I, I think it's great that it gives an additional layer of depth to that interaction because the customers will already have some familiarity with you. And the other thing that I like about it, and, and especially your approach, is I think in the era that we're in now, the utilization of content and, and people creating content from a variety of vantage points is where we're at. And I had a guest on the podcast a year ago who's a, his, his specialty, his business is really digital marketing for restaurants. And what he identified, which you don't think about, but it's so true, is that Restaurants will take so much time taking pictures of their food and putting that on social media when what they should really be doing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but but think about how much more of an impact you make by creating organic content where people get to know you, get to know you, Brian, your philosophy, your approach, funny stories. It's just a much better approach. Well, it's hard to tell because we've discovered just by dro dropping these episodes what we've discovered what people actually like. We did a little commercial for that, that trio event. Was it mm -hmm. trio? trio? Yeah, trio. And which, then, which is a, uh, they, they don't like that we call it a, well, an air fryer. Air fryer. But air it fryer. is an air fryer. Basically. I mean, it's a super advanced air fryer. But it's an air fryer. Yeah. But anyway. It's a comp tabletop combi oven, let's call that. But we were surprised to see that what attracted the people was that little tidbit of me going into the kitchen and yeah. And just going in, in behind the scenes and everybody just lost their minds. Like, oh my God, this is like an amazing part of something we'd never get to see. Right. And then, so you're right. If we can focus on those things that people really want to see, discover, it's trying to figure out what people want to see, right? The food pictures, yeah, everybody's doing food pictures. There's a thousand beautiful food shots. And okay, you should look at it, look up us. But that scene is like, oh. Let me dig into this a little bit more. And you know what else, Brian? Like people view themselves as experts about the restaurant business just because they go to restaurants and eat, yeah. right? Yeah. So the the content that that is created around this industry has an immediate interest that other types of businesses wouldn't because even though most people are never going to be chefs, never own a restaurant, although they may want to, 
everybody goes to restaurants and they feel that they're expert enough. Right. Um, I have a huge gripe with that. I've, I've spoken <laughs> about it many times, yeah. And talk about that a little bit more because there, it is an interesting balance. Like on the one hand, you could see it from the perspective, hey, I go out to eat a lot. I can give an opinion. On the other hand, but not there's on the so spot. much you don't know. They're brave behind the keyboard. Yeah, they're, right. they're brave behind the keyboard. <laughs> right. Listen, uh, just because you like to eat out a lot does not make you an expert in it. Just because you like to listen to a lot of music does not make you an expert in writing music. They're, it's two totally different things. You can have an opinion about it. There's nothing wrong with that. You're free to have whatever opinion you want. You can say the sky is purple, whatever. No one's going to stop you. They're going to call you a moron. You probably are if you say something like that. But ultimately, it doesn't make you a pro just because you partake in it. With that said, their opinions are valuable. But people also have to understand that there is a line and it stops somewhere. And also, you may not know what the hell you're talking about. I'm not saying don't put in reviews. I'm not saying don't give your opinions, but it doesn't make you a pro. You, just because you like to dine at lots of restaurants, and there are many people who've eaten at a lot more restaurants than I ever will that can afford much be better restaurants yeah. than I can afford to go to, but they have no idea what it takes to operate a restaurant. They have no idea how to set up payroll, tipped employees versus salaried employees, no idea about... What Over it takes. time. Oh, yeah. And, and that's just Spread of one hours. component <laughs> of operating a, re a, a business, a restaurant business. You have to make sure your grease traps get cleaned. You have to make sure that the waste oil gets disposed of properly. You have to make sure you have workers' comp. and you have proper maintenance on your refrigeration, on everything. your ovens, on your AC. Um, and if all of these things are not working harmoniously and that causes one bad dish to go out, and that's the dish that someone complains about. They have every right to have their opinion on it. And you know what? There's usually a nugget of truth in every opinion, whether it's good or bad. So I do think it's worth reading and listening to every opinion. But as an operator, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Ultimately, just because you partake doesn't make you a pro in something. I think that's true. No, no. And, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast. And my mission in doing it was to really build content around the business side of it because, Paul, I mean, Le Ravage and before that your father, you've been in this business for literally decades. And it's kind of what you were saying, Brian. People, they see the glamorous movies or walking into the place or Rick from Casablanca, but they don't understand that there's a tremendous amount of challenges that are purely business related. And even beyond what you were saying, Brian, you can have all the food go out magnificently well all the time. If you're not operating the business properly, the great food, the great location, the great ambiance won't save you. As from, from your perspective, Paul, in doing it so long, what would you say are some of the, the core business challenges of running Le Ravage that you're extremely attentive to that somebody who's not in the restaurant business, or even if they are in the restaurant business, they would they would benefit from your opinion. What are some of those core just business challenges that a restaurateur has to be on top of consistently? I'm going to pick out that one word you said, consistent. The food needs to be consistent, meaning the quality. But if someone ends up having a favorite dish at your place, you want them coming back for that exact same dish over and over and over. It's the secret to the most successful food chains is consistency. Now, a lot of restaurants pride themselves on changing their menu quite often. So there's a market for that. And you better hope that you did your homework and then you did everything you could possibly do that guarantee that all those dishes that you're brand spanking you on the menu are delicious. But such as myself, who's been there for 40 years, literally, and I have customers who come with their family. They're sometimes at the same table. You have two to three to four generations sitting at the same table, and you have one generation after the other saying, my God, this is, this is how I remember it. This is exactly the dish I ate. And you want that Proust moment of like, oh my God, that memory coming back to you. It's like, ah. Oh. So the Proust moment, for those who haven't read Proust, is if for those of you who have watched Ratatouille, is when the food critic 
eats bites into that ratatouille, all his core memories from childhood, all his best memories come back to him from that single bite that he ate. And that is success. It's a great point, consistency. What do you think, Brian? What would you say is sort of from the business vantage point, what is something that you think is extremely important to focus on that you'd want to... I'm actually going to expand on uh, what Paul was talking about rather than add something different. So there's two parts to consistency. One is, you know, you focus, Paul, more on the aspect of offering your customer that dish consistently over multiple generations, over multiple years. But as a business operator, instilling the importance in consistency with your staff, having them understand why it's so important and why it's so important to invest your time and energy into doing the same task over and over and over again and how valuable that is. I think people have, because of social media, ironically, people have come to devalue the importance of repetition. And something I try to tell young cooks you about up the 10,000 hours. Yeah, 10,000 hours. Why the 10,000 hours of repeating the same task over and over again is actually not the repetition itself. It's when you run into a speed bump, you've done it so many times, you have the experience of how to fix the problem. How to adapt. How to adapt, fix the problem, pivot, and still come out with the consistent dish. What do I mean by that? I mean, I'm sure you run into this issue. Let's take string beans, for example, because that's something you bitch about all the time, Paul, <laughs> when you order string beans. Uh, if you're used to getting a string bean that's two inches and it cooks for, you know, the, the cook works with this same string bean every single time. They're used to cooking it for X amount of seconds or minutes or whatever, right? They're so ingrained in that way. But then what happens if all those two-inch string beans, for, for whatever reason, disappears or that farmer or supplier no longer has that string bean or that strain dies and then you have to move into something else? And it's... Uh, four inch string bean with a, you know, the significantly thicker. Okay, well, what do we do here to remedy this to still utilize the product so we don't have to take the dish off the menu and still put it out? Do we cut it differently? Do we cook it differently? All and of the above. All of the above, right? And that's why it's so important to have consistency in even your day-to-day -day work. And I feel it's not stressed enough. The importance is not stressed enough, especially to the younger generation. Well, those 10,000 hours, now I'm going to expand on what you said, because not only do you learn also how to pivot, but you also know how to work automatically. Your brain can focus on something else. Your muscle so, memory. Muscle memory is so ingrained now that you can do, you can walk and chew gum now, which is a problem that we run into with a lot of employees. <laughs> also... When you repeat something and you, you put out the product consistently, you start to find ways to make, do it more efficiently or even improve upon it. So my shop has been open for two years now. And I only feel like now, I'm real, now that I've done it for two years, day in, day out, now I found the cheapest price on A, B, and C product. I now know the quickest way to bust out 100 sandwiches. But that wouldn't have happened if I didn't do the same task over and over again, day in and day out. I think consistency as a concept is so, I think it's probably the most important thing in business and perhaps in life because without it, nothing happens. And the cumulative benefits that you get from attacking a situation day in and day out, and nobody's 100% every time, right? But 60% is better than zero. I'm talking about in life, 70%. Paul, how would you say, if any, you've seen the consumer change over the years? Is the consumer noticeably different now than, say, 10 or 20 years ago? The consumer is definitely more educated. I know that we had to... So, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember that, you know, the American consumer, when it came to French food, we had to educate them. Now, that same clientele has done leaps and bounds. And now, because of New York especially, there's so much influence, 
I don't want to say that we've been surpassed, but there's so many options now. There's so many choices. There's so many fusions. You can so many ingredients that that have like so now people expect a little bit more, and if it's not more, then I have and then that's not the direction I want to take. I've learned that I have to focus on the retro. I have to go now. I have to go backwards and really focus on doing the original classic way. Of doing the recipe and presenting your, the originality of the dish, so I've seen my dishes now go back to an older version of itself. That it's a little bit more comfort food. I I try to stay away from the word fine dining and more French comfort food. That opens the door for me to do all those old family classics and to be able to reintroduce like all these fancy dishes, what they were originally and how they were meant to be originally. That's really interesting, but it's true because I remember when in the say the eighties or seventies, French food in and of itself was exotic. Yeah, and now, Brian, when you decided to launch your concept, which is of course around the sandwich, did you go into it thinking that you had an approach or you had certain menu options that was going to be clearly distinct from other types of sandwich shops? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So, what would talk me through your thought process and going to market like that? So the New York. Sandwich scene overall, I would say, is Paul likes to use this word a lot, antiquated, <laughs> right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It, but generally, it's going to be one of three things: a bodega, which bodega sandwiches are great, a Jewish delicatessen, or an Italian delicatessen, and they're all great. They're all legendary. But I feel like there's been no en- innovation in that scene or any adventure in that scene. I, I knew, what are you talking about? Chopped sandwiches are all the rage. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I would. It's definitely changed as of the last, I would say, four or five years. For sure, I think it started even before Mission Sandwich came onto the scene. But when I started coming up with my sandwich creations, I treated all of the sandwiches like any dish I would put on at a fine dining restaurant menu, and but just now served in between two slices of bread. And what's interesting about doing that is once you put anything in between two slices of bread, you actually devalue it. So if I wanted to do Moroccan-style lamb shank in between two slices of bread, I can't get the same price out of that from the customer as if I presented it on a nice plate. So that, that presented another challenge as well. But I'm so proud that we figured it out after two years. Um, Mention the two slices of bread, by the way. What kind of bread? Do you it's uh, also the bread we use is very distinct. It's something very popular in the Bay Area called Dutch Crunch. So, in addition to creating unique combinations in between the bread, our bread itself is also very unique. So, Dutch Crunch is uh, a, actually a soft roll, despite the name, but it does have this layer of rice flour paste on top that gives this wonderful texture and sweetness. And it's also just a very robust bread, but not a bread that you bite into and will cut up the roof of your mouth. Very interesting, because um, you mentioned the bread, and that's sort of the old sort of maxim about sandwiches, that the bread is such a crucial ingredient. But at the same time, you brought something up that I'd never thought of before, but you're right. When you do put it in a sandwich form, it does subconsciously lead to that devaluation, which really doesn't make sense necessarily. As business owners and as chef restaurateurs in the New York scene, one of the challenges that I think exists and I've discussed with prior guests is that New York City, on the one hand, it's the dining capital of America, arguably the world. We have a lot of tourists, but it's also a place where you have people who live here that are very demanding, that are very knowledgeable, that love their food. How do you balance the the challenges, or how do you find that? Because let's take your, your, your restaurant, Paul. You're in the theater district, obviously, so you're going to have a lot of people who come to your restaurant as part of the theater experience. I would say it's a New York institution of classic French cuisine been around. People are coming for that. You're probably going to get tourists. How do you find the makeup of your customers are, and does that in any way impact how you drive your restaurant forward on a, say, monthly or quarterly basis? Because not every restaurant has to accommodate those many different segments of the market. You know, if you have a restaurant in the suburbs, you're dealing with mostly locals or the business crowd. If you're in a hyper-touristy area, you know you're just going to be dealing with the tourists. 
neither of you are in that dimension. How do you, do you find that creates a challenge or it's just something to be? So Le Rivage, the geography is kind of unique. So yes, we are in a touristy area. We're in <laughs> right next door to Times Square. But most of our clientele is going to the theater. And the bulk of our clientele makes reservations way ahead of time. So usually they buy a theater ticket, they make reservations at Le Rivage. So we're pretty booked in advance. So people think because we're in a tourist area, we're going to have a lot of tourists. We do get our fair share of tourists, but I'd say maybe they're 10, 20% at best. And they fill in the gaps of the, the empty slots that we have of non-reservations. And then once the theater crowd has left, we become more of a neighborhood restaurant because a lot of people who live in that neighborhood now know the mounds of people have rushed off to the theater. All these restaurants are now having their little quiet moment. So now all of a sudden we go from a jam-packed, I hate to use this expression, but it's exactly what it is. It's almost like a school cafeteria. The bell rings, everybody walks in, the bell rings again, everybody walks out. That's the pre-theater rush. And then all of a sudden we need to adapt to a neighborhood restaurant, which is more leisurely. Sometimes it's hard to turn, to slow down the machine. That locomotive has picked up so much speed that when they all left, everybody's so juiced up and like, it's hard to settle down and do like a normal restaurant dining experience. What we've also introduced now, we've introduced live entertainment at night. This is something new from the pandemic because a lot of uh, these artists were without work and they were just living in the neighborhood. They had, first of all, they were hungry. So I was offering food and you know some money to come play at the restaurant. And we and this took off and we're doing it every night. And that also creates a different ambiance. Now this is even more leisurely, not slower. It's like, or maybe they even order differently. They're just doing cocktails and desserts. Or if it's late at night, they're just finishing off their soiree. So it's like, we're adapting, we're pivoting constantly. And for lunch, the same thing. We have matinee days and we have business lunches. So all the business lunches know not to come on Wednesdays and Saturdays and the weekends, and they come Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So everybody's learned, adapted, and everybody avoids each other. So we're constantly dealing with different clientels. So I'm lucky to say that I've adapted to all of it. It's very cool. I mean, there aren't many restaurants in the world that have to exist in, in those two spaces that you're describing. And yet each space is so significant in New York, you know, the leisurely dining, the late night, the hanging out and the theater rush. So that's very, very cool. One of the subjects I've explored in a number of earlier episodes, and I would be curious to know your thoughts on, Brian, are the third-party delivery systems. Do you use them? How do you yep. find them? And and what are your thoughts about them? Because I I would imagine that would it be fair to say that takeout is a big part yep. of the of the revenue? Yep. I would say it's probably about thirty percent of our revenue. What are your thoughts on the third parties and just delivery in general? I know that delivering food creates challenges. Some foods don't travel well, but I think with your concept, I would just love to know your thoughts on it. Yeah. So my concept was developed with the third-party apps in mind with delivery in mind. When we first opened, we were takeout only. We didn't even have seating. Now we put up some benches and we have a small seating area. As far as the apps go, we are on what everyone refers to as the big three, which is DoorDash, Seamless, Uber Eats. DoorDash, Seamless being the same company, Uber Eats, and then Grubhub, Seamless, Uber Eats, and DoorDash slash Caviar. Uh, those are the big three. We also offer, uh, we, we're on another app called Toast, which is also our POS system. That's just their like in-house app that you can utilize. There's good and bad. The good is that you, uh, number one, don't have to hire your own delivery people. So that's one less staff staffing headache to worry about. Uh, it also expands your delivery radius. It also expands your exposure. And it creates a great convenience for the customer. And it also makes it easier on the restaurant establishment because I've grown up uh, working in Chinese restaurants back in the day. And a lot of those places have, are heavily reliant on delivery and takeout. And in the past, you would pick up the phone. You had a phone with multiple lines and you'd pick up the phone. What's your address? What's your name? What's your phone number? Blah, blah, blah. They'd write down the order. Then they walk that dupe to the kitchen. Now... 
you don't even have to interact with the person. A ticket pops up. And in the kitchen. In the kitchen. A ticket pops up at the register, <laughs> you know. And we've taken it a step further. We have a label printer now, so we don't even have to write anything anymore. The, the label has the each individual item. So as each individual item is made, we put the label, and this really makes it very convenient. For example, we have a lot of movies filming around us. They'll place orders of 15 to 20 sandwiches, and they all have their own allergies and modifications. Uh, they want it labeled per person. We used to have to handwrite all this stuff, and now it just pops up per label, has all the modifications on it, who it is, and it just it's a huge time saver. The downside is that it costs us money to have these apps on in the form of their commissions. And there's ma many ways to get uh, to figure this out. I'm not going to go into detail. But at the end of the day, we don't really make money on the apps. Uh, what it really helps do is work down your overhead, right? It also keeps the, the pro you know, you have more business in general, so it keeps the product fresh and rotating. And, you know, we're, we're not sitting on inventory for very long. And um, it's just, I'd hate to put it this way, uh, but it's more or less like a necessary evil. If we did not have the delivery app business, we would not be able to survive. But would I prefer to not have these apps? 100%, for sure. I think you said it right. It's a necessary evil. They've definitely taken a lot of the, because, you know, as, as you both know and as I know, getting, especially in New York City, getting food delivered was not an innovation. It was all of the other aspects of the app that made it an innovation. And to replicate that is almost prohibitively expensive. And so I suppose I see what you're saying. And I think as you scale, it'll give you an opportunity to negotiate better pricing with people. So there's ways to turn it to an economic advantage. For sure. Paul, how have you found the nightlife to be in New York relative to say five or 10 years ago. I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in New York. I don't live in New York City now. I go to New York once every, maybe twice a month. Steven. Don't say I, as much. I go to bed at nine o'clock now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Father of a young kid, I, I guess. But just, or just from a restaurant standpoint, I, I remember when I lived in New York, let's take it there. It was very common to have several places open at two or three in the morning to go in and mm -hmm. get a drink. Many of them would have appetizers. New York really was a city that didn't sleep. I know some of our customers now are closing it at midnight. Obviously, French cuisine is different. But do you have any thoughts on how it might have changed? I grew up, you know, my father's restaurant on the Upper East Side was famously known for being the after hours place to go. And on top of it, it was also famous among the industry people. So a lot of the restaurant people when you, when they get off work, they could go have a full-blown meal at midnight, two o'clock in the morning at my dad's place. My father would not come home till like four, four thirty in the morning. I remember, and I remember not having to wake him, not waking him up because he would get up almost in time to come pick me up at school. Yeah, that and was the restaurant. That business. was the restaurant business. But we, but but we filled a niche, and we became. Uh, that's how he became famous and it became like a celebrity hotspot like you go there at night and you, you know, now you had like industry people mixing with celebrities and everything it was it just became a thing it was it was very interesting it was very and I grew up in that atmosphere and to be honest with you it was great fun I'm sure I, I would imagine that must exist to some extent in New York still yeah there's not, some, not as much as before I yes mean, you uh, brought uh, me to a, a place uh, not too long ago what was it on, on 23rd street where did we go where was that? Where we went, um, the Mexican place? The, no, the South American restaurant. Oh, uh, Copiella. Yeah, yeah, that, that place is open twenty four hours. I mean, that's one of the few right now. So I, you know, I'm a little younger than Paul, uh, but I, I also, you know, generally I'm in bed by. I, I'm a little naughtier than you. I go to bed at ten thirty. <laughs> but um, you know, I'll have friends come in from out of town, and uh, they're jet lagged, and we want to grab a few drinks. I remember. It was a Friday night and my buddy was in town and I was like, oh, you know, I don't get work done with work till 10. And so we met up and we were fully expecting to have a few drinks and maybe stay out till two or three. I got to tell you, we ended up finding places to hang out, but it was so much harder than I remember it being in the past. 
we we went to places that say that they're open till 1 a.m. We get there and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, we're doing last call. It was 11.30. We're like, yeah. what? It's well, Friday night. A lot of businesses are running into the trouble with spread of hours, employee retention and all that. So they're doing less with less too. And I got to say, you're right. Across the board, you'll see businesses, like a, a lot of my neighbors are that used to be open seven days a week are only open five or six days or or they, or they only open up for dinner. They don't open up for lunch anymore. So, And, and I remember reading articles, uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, how, and I don't know if this is still the case, but coming out of the pandemic, you had an early, it was almost like there were two dinner rushes. You had the early dinner rush of people who were in the city, and then you had the later dinner rush of people who were working from home and they needed to get out of the house, and by seven o'clock they would come out. So there's always changes in New York, but that was something that um, I wanted your opinion on because that's sort of the hallmark of New York and, and what I remember. To the extent it may not be back to where it was, I do think it's going to come back because from what I'm seeing and, and just from my visibility where I am, the hospitality industry from a foundational standpoint has enormous momentum behind it. And, and New York City, even with the challenges that it has, it just keeps going through them. And, and even anecdotally, when I'm in New York, I'm saying to myself, there's no, there's no second New York City. You know what I mean? At the same time, and I would be, and you know, maybe wrap it up with this because you guys would both give a very interesting perspective. Is there a trend? Is there a dynamic? Is there something about the restaurant industry that you see that may not be super material now, but in the future will be? Any aspect of it, anything that you've identified could be a trend, could be some new behaviors on the part of customer staff, anything that's just starting to manifest itself on your radar that might be something bigger in the coming years? I actually have something that ties into what you're asking, but also into the topic of the New York nightlife, which is I'm actually, ultimately New York's going to thrive. New York's going to strive. There is, I agree with you, there is only one New York, but as far as nightlife goes in New York, I, I think it's yet to be seen because I, I, I believe the landscape has changed and here are some of the reasons why. Number one, now you have dating apps. You know, one of the only ways you used to meet people were at clubs, at restaurants, and things like that. Now you have this ability to reach people directly, kind of vet them out first. And ultimately, they are going to need a place to go and meet. But I feel like that's one part of the market that's been taken out, so to speak. That's not taken out, but changed. Another thing is uh, the cost. I think a lot of people don't go out as much because of it being cost prohibitive. It's just a lot harder for younger people now to fork over the money for a $17 to $20 cocktail these days. And then there's the whole health thing. I, uh, you know, you and I have spoken about it, Paul. People just don't drink yeah. like they used to. I was going to get into that. I was going to yeah. get more specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The younger crowds don't drink. Yeah, they don't so drink. So restaurants, you know, they need to make that profit from the alcohol. That's a big part of the of your profit, and it's diminishing. So now you have to either embellish that first cocktail, either make that cocktail, either you decide to make one expensive cocktail, and that's all they're drinking, and you have to really have a show of it, you know, like with the smoke and the this and the that, and and then really charge for it, or you have to do like you know. Like cheap drinks. And based on volume. Exactly. So, um, so I think the landscape is changing, and I don't know what that means. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do think that these are th things that have greatly affected our industry. Um, I think that's really interesting, and I, I hadn't thought of that. I might have to amend my opinion because you're right. I mean, social media, I think, in the one hand, has been a creative to the restaurant because people like to take pictures of themselves, their food, show themselves that they're out. But you're right, technology has enabled people to accomplish things that they had to do in person. And I think you're right, the cost, you know, there's a lot more information out there now about the economic challenges that young people, even young people that are employed and in pretty good jobs are facing just to live in New York. And the alcohol thing is very interesting. I know in New York City, I, I 
personally don't drink and I, I don't do anything really. I'm, I'm a square like that now. But I wonder how the, the legalization of marijuana and cannabis, has that been a positive or maybe a negative to the restaurant business following up on what you're saying? Can I actually add to that as Please. well? I also believe the culture of going out has also changed the perception of it. I remember when I would go out with a bunch of bros and, oh, we're going to go meet girls and we're going to get wasted tonight. Th that type of, that was for me growing up, and I'm pretty sure for you too, Paul, that was a fun night out. We're going to have a good time tonight. That's almost frowned upon these days. The mentality of partying hard like that is almost in some ways looked down upon. You know, uh, I mean, that's just the general consensus. I feel I actually let me take that back. I feel like it's not romanticized anymore. Except in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. No, I, I like what you're saying, Brian. Yeah. You're right, because I look at, you know, I have kids that are uh, teenagers. My, my oldest is in college, and you're right. One of the things I notice is exactly what you're saying. And this is a positive thing as a parent, and I think it's a positive thing for society. But a lot of the content that I see them consuming is really extolling the virtues of discipline, hard work, goal setting, and not glamorizing the stuff that may have been glamorized, Paul, for you and I. That's an interesting point. But I'd, I'd, love, it, I'd love it if you guys have any thoughts. Maybe, maybe it hasn't manifested itself. Has the, the ubiquitousness of, of cannabis and the legalization, has that had any impact? Or, or do you think it's having an impact on the restaurant it, scene? It does have an impact. You do have a lot of requests. Can you do dinner parties with introducing CBD and this like that? I'm like, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to have to deal with it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't know where the law is and rules are and what the limitations are. I don't want to have to worry about it. But again, a lot of people who, you know, it's a lot safer to get take an edible and smoke weed than it is to drink. There, well, there's so much liability in drinking. I was, I was going to say, I didn't think about this until you started <laughs> talking about that. I think the cannabis industry is helping my type of restaurant because yeah. they're getting, you know, they're they getting get the high. Munchies. They get the munchies. They're not going to go out. They're not going to get dressed and, <laughs> no. you know, dressed to the well, nines. Let's get a look, sandwich. Let's get a, let's get a pizza. Let's get a sandwich. Let's get some Indian food tonight. Oh, how do I get that without moving from this chair? They hold <laughs> their phone and they order on the apps. And that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. And we are guilty of it as well. Yeah. How many times have we been in the pocket? Oh, we get yeah. in the mood and we just order yeah. a ton of Chinese. When he says food. mood, we we yeah. get high. God, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? what? Yeah, no. I mean, it, it's really an interesting thing because uh, people's behaviors change. And ultimately, New York is resilient, and the hospitality industry is resilient. And it's and guess what's going to happen? It's going to adapt and pivot, and we are going to see a change, and it's going to happen whether we like it or not. And the ones that are going to survive are the ones that do adapt and pivot. It's a game of, New York City is a game of musical chairs, except chairs are not taken away. The people are, you know, and those keep getting switched. And you have to find a chair, you know, and you have to sit in that chair and make the most of it. Mm, it's great insight. Well, I've really enjoyed speaking to both of you. This has been an incredibly uh, informative and thought-provoking episode and uh, I very much enjoy it. So, Paul and Brian, thanks a lot, guys, for coming in. I, I really appreciate it, guys. This so, Tag, you're it. Now it's your turn to come back to us. Yes. <laughs> Would love it. Would love yes. it. It was, a it was a great time. Yeah, but, I, can, uh, I can really talk to you all day, Stephen. So, let's let's do this again. Let's have you back at our studio. But this was a lot of fun. I had a absolutely. Blast. And again, it's the So You Want to Get Fat podcast YouTube channel. And you've got Chef Brian Sow. And it really is great content. And... Um, just a great time, guys. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for listening to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. Please be sure to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And to learn more about Woolco Foods or Stephen Toberoff, please visit us at woolcofoods.net. <laughs>